thank you all very much for having me. Uh, I always love to come to uh, Kiwanis meetings. I, I've had the, the great pleasure of being the keynote speaker a couple times at your uh, regional conventions, once when we had it here at uh, uh, in Bend, and then uh, a couple years ago up in, up in Portland. So uh, thanks for all you do to help our, our young people in our community. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I appreciate Jessica clarifying why I'm here. Uh, I wear a couple of different hats. Uh, I'm, on the, I'm on the city council and, and running for uh, re-election. Um, and I'm also the executive director of the Redmond Proficiency Academy. And I'm here today to talk to you about RPA uh, as we uh, enter our 10th year of operation. And I want to tell you a little bit about our school and, and what we do there and, and uh, what, kind of, what it means for the kids and what it means for the community. And uh, I've got about, uh, I think, about four and a half hours. So um, if that's enough time, that's great. Otherwise, we'll try and get it done in 20 minutes, OK? Uh, see how we do. Uh, so let me start by telling you this. Uh, I've been a public educator uh, my entire adult life. I'm, I'm working on 25 years or so as a public educator. I've been a teacher and a coach and an elementary school principal and a high school principal and a district office administrator. And now I'm the executive director of, of the Redmond Proficiency Academy. I'm a, I'm a huge believer in public schools, and RPA is a public charter school, and we're part of that mission. You know, if you look around, uh, lots of people will tell you that the education system is failing. Uh, I think that's a, a popular uh, mantra. And I think there's some empirical data that says there are some struggles, and, and we're going to talk about some of that today. But I also want to tell you that in my time as a public educator, I believe that our young people today are more capable as learners than they've ever been. Right? That over the past 25 years in my experience, our students that are exiting our system are doing so with more knowledge and more skills than they have ever had before. And what's occurred over time is that we've continued to ramp up the standards as we should. And what we haven't done though in our public education system is ramp up the supports necessary so that all of our students can meet those standards. And that's the struggle that we really face today. You know, you, you probably read in the paper uh, issues about attendance, right? Chronic attendance issues in Oregon. Uh, graduation issues in Oregon. I want to touch on those two things and then talk to you about how RPAs work with those. RPAs have been identified as a school with a chronic attendance problem. I'll just be honest with you about that. The Redmond School District is working with a, uh, somebody from ODE about chronic attendance. We know that attendance at schools is, imp is important. At RPA, though, we have a unique model where we use a collegiate scheduling model, which means that students enroll in classes on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or on Tuesday, Thursday. Our Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes meet for an hour. Our Tuesday, Thursday classes meet for 90 minutes. And so it looks like a student might have a schedule on a college campus. So at Redmond High School, where I served as the principal for five years, we were on a five-period day. And if a student missed fifth period, so they went to four of their five classes, they weren't marked as absent for the day. They missed the period, but they weren't marked as absent for the day. At RPA, if I have five classes, and four of them are on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and one of them is on Tuesday, Thursday, if I miss that class on Tuesday, I get counted as absent for an entire day, because it might be the only class I have that day. And so one student misses one class, and they're present. One student misses one class, and they're absent. If you extrapolate that out, a student at a traditional school who missed fifth period all week long would be marked absent for fifth period, but be marked in attendance at school for five days. A student at RPA who missed their Tuesday and their Thursday class, but went, were there all day Monday, Wednesday, Friday, missed two classes, but was only in attendance three out of five days. Right? And so our attendance issue isn't really the issue that it might seem to be, and we're working on that in recoding the way we do attendance. That's a lot of inside baseball, I didn't want to bore you with that, but sometimes when statistics get put out there, I think it's important that people understand what made those happen. Uh, that said, we want students to attend. When I met with ODE to talk to ODE across the state about attendance problems in the state, I told them they've got to have uh, come up with a central organ modifier. <laughs> and, and what I mean by that is, is this. People that move to central Oregon, people that live in central Oregon, education is a priority. But I'm not sure it's always the number one priority, right? In fact, 14 years ago when I was the principal of Revan High School, there was a day on the calendar called Environmental Day. And it happened in, in October. And now keep in mind, I moved from, from Eugene, uh, from the U of O, to Redmond, right? And so 
I saw environmental day and I thought, well, that's odd. In Eugene, I had a pretty good idea what environmental day might look like, and it would look different than here, <laughs> right? Uh, I was like, well, that's interesting. What are that's about? So I asked around, I said, what is this environmental day? Why do you have a day scheduled for that? <laughs> oh, that's the first day of hunting season. So nobody comes to school because they're out in the environment. I was like, oh. And they said, yeah, we just changed the name. We just used to call it hunting day. But we decided to change it to environmental day, right? Well, then that day went away in totality. But guess what? People still went hunting, right? And I guarantee you this, when you look around Central Oregon, the very first day that there's snow in these mountains, attendance in, at Central Oregon schools will go down. On a beautiful day in, in, in December, when it's one of those, you know, those bright, sunny, warm days that we get sometimes, <clears throat> Smith Rock will be packed, and there'll be kids missing school, right? And it's not because people don't think school's important, but people in Central Oregon love the outdoors. And so one of the things that I've cautioned them about looking at Central Oregon schools, whether it's Shea's schools in Bend or Mike's schools here in Redmond, is understand that some people in Central Oregon, when given the choice between a day on the mountain and a day in the classroom, are picking a day on the mountain. And that's not a problem they have in the valley, right? And we just have to keep that in mind. Yet again, that's not a reason not to encourage our kids to come to school. Our kids ought to be in school as much as possible. In fact, I would argue that we don't have a long enough school year, we don't have a long enough school day, uh, and we should do those things. But to look simply at one metric of attendance and say, well, that's why schools are failing, I don't think it does justice to what's really happening. Now, with regard to the graduation rate, Oregon's graduation rate is one of the lowest in the country. We all know that. But what we don't know is that Oregon is tied at number one for the highest standards for graduation. Oregon requires 24 credits for a high school graduation. That's the highest number of credits any state in the, in the union requires. And so the highest level of requirement, right, combined with, depending upon what statistic you want to look at, a funding rate that is not commensurate with some of its peers. And you've got a recipe for lower graduation rates. Right? If you say the standard's going to be high, the funding's going to be in the middle, uh, there's a chance that your graduation rate might be lower. Now again, not a reason not to focus on it. But I also want to be honest about what our kids can do, what our kids are capable of doing, what they're doing every day. And specifically, I want to talk to you about what RPA is doing to, to try and address those things. So, let me go back to how RPA started. I came here 14 years ago to be the principal at Revan High School. Uh, I was there for five years. One of the first things I discovered is that we had a freshman failure rate of about 35 to 40 percent. And what that meant was 35 to 40 percent of our freshmen failed one or more classes every term. Now, that has a couple of problems. One is you've got a remediation rate immediately built into your system. Right? So we're, we're immediately increasing class sizes by 40% of freshmen because they've got to retake the class because the first time didn't work. Right? So that's one issue. A second issue is you get, end up having students that are credit deficient. They're behind, and so they, don't, uh, they, they struggle to catch up. And then you've got what I think is really important is this idea of how does a student view themselves? If they view themselves as a failure, it's difficult to motivate them to continue on in a path that gets more and more difficult every time you fail a class. About that time, the state of Oregon, through the Department of Education, made a ruling about the use of proficiency-based methodology, which meant that students could be awarded credit and grades based upon the demonstration of their knowledge rather than the completion of seat time. We put that into play and created the Freshman Academy and as was reported in the Ben Bulletin at the time, we saw freshman failure rates drop from 35-40% to about 5% in one year because we implemented this proficiency-based methodology that said failure is not an option here. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this, the traditional model of education and flip it on its head. In a traditional model, time is the constant and learning is the variable. And what I mean by that is a student might take a 12-week class and at the end of that 12 weeks, Whatever your grade is, however many points you've earned, whatever you've learned or not learned ends and it's put on a transcript and you either go forward or backward depending upon that thing. Right? And so the learning is variable, <coughs> but the time is consistent. Because we have an ed education system that's rooted in the Carnegie unit that's based upon some agrarian methodology that may or may not be outdated, can 
depending on what you think about how the economy works today. But the, the, the credit system says you got to have 63 seat hours to earn a credit, or a half credit, excuse me, 63 seat hours to earn a half credit. Well, so the important thing there is the time. It says nothing about how much you have to learn. It just says you have to do the time. And what a proficiency model does is flip that on its head. says the learning is the constant, and time is the variable. Right? That we tell every student in every class, here's what you're going to learn in this class, and here's the knowledge you have to demonstrate to earn the credit. If that takes you the exact amount of time we have in the, in the course, great. If it takes you less, great. It takes you more, great. Learning is the constant, and time is the variable. Now, when you think about it, that's not so far-fetched in the world, right? I mean, if I asked all of us to tie our shoe right now, somebody do it fast, and somebody still might not be able to do it by the time I'm done talking, right? And that's kind of how the world works. Proficiency is not new in the rest of the world. For example, how many of you have flown on an airplane recently, right? Judging by how they grow at the airport, many of you, right? Um, <laughs> Whoever's flying that plane demonstrated proficiency to fly that plane. We hope so. Well, yeah. we're, we're assuming through their licensure that they did. But the point being is that we don't know how they demonstrated that. Maybe they went through a military training program. Maybe they went through a private training program. Maybe it took them three years. Maybe it took them six months. But at the end of the day, they were given the authority by the institution that governs that to fly the plane. In the, in the world of attorneys, the Oregon State Bar, they don't even give you a score anymore. They either say you met or did not meet. Right? And so proficiency exists in, in everything. And when you think about it, those of you that are employers perhaps, right? are you more concerned that, that the employee takes the time to do the work or gets the work completed? Right? Because sometimes it takes us a little longer to do something, sometimes a little bit shorter. But if we have a finite time set and that's what we're measuring, then the, then the production is going to be variable. And we want the learning to be constant. And so we've taken that methodology uh, and we put it into place at, at the high school and we had success. At about that same time, the state of Oregon began awarding grants for charter schools. And so 12 years ago around my kitchen table, uh, <coughs> we drew up a plan for a charter school. And then we got awarded the grant. And uh, those of you that ever worked in the world of grants know that the best and worst moment is when you get a grant, <laughs> right? Because it's awesome you got it, and then it means you got to do whatever it says you're going to do. And uh, so I drew up the very first budget for, for RPA, and I, I said, I wonder if we can get 50 kids to do this. Can we get 50 students that want to do this thing? Well, we opened 10 years ago with 148 students in grades 9 through 12. Today, in our 10th year, we have 907 students in grades 6 through 12, and we have 271 students on our waiting list. We've seen unprecedented growth for charter schools. In fact, we've grown to be one of the largest and the most successful charter school in Oregon, and we've done it right here in Redmond. And one of the reasons that I think that's really important is that Redmond supported an innovative idea and took a chance on trying to find another way to provide for our young people. And I think that's really powerful. And as we've developed over time, we have never believed that what we do is better than what other public education entities provide. We believe that we are another way of doing this. We believe that we can provide students <coughs> with another option. And as, as disparities grow in our, in our young people and what they bring to school, our options have to increase. When I was an elementary school principal, I, I didn't understand this until I sat in on kindergarten screening. And there were some students who could read from a chapter book, and there were some students that didn't know the difference between a letter and a number, right? And those same students are put in the same structure for the same amount of time to try and learn the same things. And what we're trying to do is provide another option for our young people so that they can uh, grow and, and become who they're supposed to be. And so uh, that's what our PA has provided. We operate under a contract with the Redmond School District. We're just finishing up our second five-year contract. We're, we're in the process of negotiating a new 10-year contract for RPA. Um, the school district caps by our agreement with them uh, the number of Redmond School District students we can have at 525, which means that over 375 students from outside of Redmond travel to Redmond every day to get their education. We have students from Bend, 
Madras, Sisters, Crook County all come to Redmond to get their education. And I think that's a, uh, I think that's a, a feather in the cap of Redmond to, be, uh, to have that educational opportunity where people come from all around Central Oregon to receive it. Um, what we've done financially is unique as well. Uh, charter schools receive less funding than, than traditional schools. What we receive is 95% of the state school fund. We don't receive any of the federal funding. Uh, we don't receive any of the grant funding. We, get, we only receive 95% of the state funding. And with that 95%, we're charged with producing results that are uh, equal to or better than the results of the public system. This past year, our graduation rate, which was just over 83%, exceeded the local school districts, all of the local school districts, um, and exceeded the state average. Uh, and so we believe that we are, we are producing on the promise of providing an innovative learning environment with results at a lower cost. It costs less for our PA to do business. One of the things we've had to do as a nonprofit organization that, that I'm charged with running is secure building space. And so what we did is we went out and we have, uh, we've, in two different offerings, sold about $15 million of municipal bonds. So not taxpayer bonds, bonds sold on the open market uh, with investors that are investing in our school. And we've purchased two downtown buildings, renovated three downtown buildings, and we built a brand new middle school uh, three years ago that we opened uh, on the mayor. And so we're the only school in the state uh, that has done that, uh, that has been in a position to uh, have the financial wherewithal to, uh, to, to have that bonded indebtedness. And we did it on 95% of the state school fund. Uh, and so one of the challenges of charter schools is to provide unique and innovative pedagogical opportunities, but also to provide uh, financial uh, stability in the process from which other districts or other entities might be able to, to take lessons and so, uh, or learn from, which means we have to take risks and we have to you know, uh, risk failure in order to achieve success. And I tell people when I talk about schools, the worst high school in Oregon will open its doors tomorrow and it will keep its doors open three months from now and its doors will open next fall and the fall after that. Charter school world doesn't work that way. We only operate if students come to our school. We only operate if we produce results. So from that standpoint, it's uh, more of a, a private uh, venture in the sense of its operational status. And we have to be fiscally responsible, and we have to produce results, uh, and we have to have satisfaction from our uh, consumers in order to, to continue existing. So one thing that we're doing this year that's really unique that I want to talk to you about briefly, and then I'll take questions uh, from folks, is we know that many of our students exit and head into the workforce. We want to ensure that as our students enter the workforce, that they are prepared to be uh, effective members of that workforce. What we noticed is that not just at RPA, but across the system, uh, students that were earning a high school diploma may or may not have had the skills necessarily to go right into the workforce. So we are partnering with ACT, which is the, you, you'll probably likely know as the college exam, college entrance exam folks. They have a program called Work Keys. Uh, and Work Keys is a series of um, career development courses that students can enroll in uh, to prepare them for the workforce. And they have just begun offering a national career readiness certification. So a student who completes a requisite number of courses at a requisite level can earn a certificate that says they are certified as nationally career ready. Um, and we have partnered with them to begin implementing that at RPA with the hope that any of our students who <coughs> walk across the stage and graduate in, in, in May either do so with an ACT score that prepares them to be successful in college or that uh, certifies them as a high school graduate or that now gives them a national career readiness certificate. And so uh, we'll have students graduating this May that will be able to not only have a high school diploma, but have that certificate that says they've completed a national career readiness program. And I'm really excited about that because we know that college isn't for, for everyone. We know that, uh, that it's not the best path for everyone. So we want to make sure we're serving all of our students, <coughs> students who want to pursue higher education, students who want to be ready in the workforce. And we believe we owe it to our community to ensure that the students that exit our system are ready to be successful. And so we've implemented that program. 
I really appreciate the chance to talk about RPA with y'all because I, I know that sometimes people don't know what that is. Why are there a bunch of kids in downtown Redmond? What's going on there? Uh, and I want to put a face with that so you know that uh, what we're doing down there is we are uh, a small part of the public school system and we're an innovative part that's trying to provide students with unique opportunities to be successful. Some of our success has come in, in ways that we didn't anticipate. We knew that when we built RPA, we wanted students to have a robust uh, enrichment program, so opportunities to participate in, in things other than just academics. And one of the programs that's grown for us has been our theater program. Um, we're, uh, we won back to back to back national championships in musical theater. Um, this little school in the, in the middle of Oregon travels to Nebraska every summer to compete with huge schools from across the country and some, some other countries. And for three years in a row, we've won the highest honors in musical theater for the work we do. And one of the reasons I attribute that, and, and I'll, I'll try to wrap up with this, is that what a charter school is able to do that a traditional school cannot do is we can employ people at the charter school who are experts in their field who may not have taken a traditional teaching path. So for example, our theater teacher is a former professional actress and who's worked on productions in Chicago and New York and has a real good sense of what it looks like to be a professional actor. And so uh, she, she is actually a Redmond High School graduate. She's a former student of mine when I was there, right? Um, but we're able to hire her and have her come in and be a teacher for us that teaches students with real world experience uh, in a way that uh, has really, I think, heightened that program. We have other examples of that. For example, one of our PE teachers is uh, JT Taylor, who runs the dojo in downtown, uh, downtown Redmond. Um, he, he's a jujitsu uh, teacher, and so many of our students take jujitsu for PE, and I think he's probably as well-trained as anybody uh, in Central Oregon to teach kids jujitsu uh, is there is. He doesn't have a traditional teaching license, but because we're a charter school, we can contract with him so he can teach our students that. Uh, and there are other examples as well, but the point being is that uh, being a charter school allows us flexibility, but the requirement is we have to deliver and we have to do so at a lower cost. And I think over the 10 years we've done that, and we're excited about the possibility of being around for, for 10 more years. Um, I don't know if I'll be around for 10 more, we'll see, uh, but uh, we're excited for RPA to be around and, and be a part of the community. So with that, I'd, I'd welcome any questions y'all might have. I know, <laughs> uh, and, and uh, we'll go from there. So if, if you don't mind, I'll go here and b bounce around. Yeah. Uh, as far as the, the schools uh, that you have downtown, is there any place here in Redmond that you can make one big school and have a few more students in there than scatter them around downtown? So our downtown campus now is consolidated really to the two, the, the two blocks. Correct. Uh, we have three main buildings, the Glacier Building, which Correct. we own, the Forest Building, which we own, and then the Evergreen Building, which we lease from the McClays. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, our intention uh, when, we, when we designed it was to not have it look like a traditional school. Because what I know from years in education is, if it looks that way, that's the way people will engage with it. I've been a part of, I think, five different design teams building schools throughout Oregon and, and various districts. And each time you go into this design process with an idea about how you want the school to work and operate. And typically, within about two weeks of it being occupied, it gets used like a, a traditional school, right, with traditional spaces. And so we're conscious about what we want to be able to do is have it not look that way. We want students to experience the, the freedom and the responsibility of walking a couple of blocks to get to class uh, and, and, and to be a part of that, to manage their schedules. So we're not looking for that space. The other thing in terms of the size is we are limiting where we are size-wise because we think pedagogically the model works best with a smaller school. Right? If we were to expand, we, I think we'd have to open a whole new school because we're at that spot now, particularly at high school, where you want students and teachers to all know each other. You don't want anybody in your school that people don't know. Right? And if you get to too large of a size, there's some research out there that says the magic number is 400. I tend to believe it can be between four and 600, and it depends on how you implement you know, cultural things. So we're not looking to get bigger, and, and, and we're excited about being a part of that, the downtown core. Yes, sir. Yeah, I had a question about <clears throat> PERS. Do you guys have to participate in PERS? And if not, what do you have for retirement for your employees? 
And then with the federal dollars that you don't get, if you were to look at the whole pie and say you're losing 5% of the state, if you said state plus federal, what percentage are you not getting? And does the Redmond School District get all of that? Okay, great question. So from PERS standpoint, uh, we're required to participate in PERS because we are funded through public dollars. So we're a public school. And so we, we do play, pay PERS for, uh, like everybody else does, like for, for schools do. One of the things we did do that was unique, and I'll share this with you, is that uh, all Oregon school districts are part of the Oregon Educational Benefits Board, OEBB. That's the insurance program that they all use. And um, for two years, we've been um, working to extract ourselves from OEBB because our healthcare costs, what, healthcare costs was, was one of our three largest drivers. Facilities, <coughs> healthcare, and PERS are our three largest cost drivers. And the healthcare costs and PERS costs, we didn't have any control over. And so we, we worked with OEBB for a couple of years and were able to extract ourselves from OEBB and engage in a self-insurance model that saved us about $180,000 this year uh, on health insurance benefits without, without uh, fundamentally changing the benefit to the employee. Uh, and so that's something we were able to do um, because of our status as a charter school and because our desire to do something different. And so we were able to, uh, to save some, some money that we could put back in the classroom that way. Um, with regard to um, the, the federal dollars, um, depending on what report you look at, charter schools at our level where we see 95% of funding from, from the state fund, um, we probably get, I would say, 75% um, of the total funds available, maybe 80%, depending on how it, how it gets calculated exactly. <coughs> and everything else flows through the school district. So the way we get funded is we have a contract with the school district. School district collects the, the money from the state for our students and then pays us monthly for, the, for our students. So that's how we, that's the mechanism to get paid. So we don't have access to any of those other federal dollars. One final question that's yeah. follow up to that. Are there still people that are arguing in the conventional school district that when you guys only get 80 cents on the dollar when you look at the whole, when everything's taken into account, that you guys are somehow a vampire on the system pulling more than you're giving back and making the other system less viable? Yeah, I think oftentimes uh, one of the criticisms of charter schools is this idea that somehow it's, it's, it's pulling from the district, it's costing the district money. RPA, in fact, does not cost the school district money, in fact. Uh, the school district, just from the, the raw number, right, I mean, gets 5% of our state school fund, uh, and they don't have to do anything. And, we, we, and, and we do that. So um, Mike and I have a great relationship, and so Mike and I have, uh, have uh, you know, developed that relationship over time, and we feel good about where it is. But yeah, I think there's still criticism that it does pull. W what, what I tell people about is that this is our community. These are our children, and we owe it to them to provide them the best possible education, and that may happen in different environments for different students. Um, but I, I like to be clear that I, I don't see us as a drain on the, the public system. I see us as, a, as an asset to it. Yeah. Carly, question then Dan. Yeah. So I'm chairman of the Florida Scholarship Committee, and the first three, two or three years that RPA existed, I think we had no scholarship applicants from there. Uh, now in the last few years, or in fact one year, I think we may have had more applicants from RPA than any other school. So it's dramatically different is the difference who is applying and being accepted to RPA, or is it something that you're doing? So two things. One, the acceptance process to RPA is uh, open, it's open enrollment. We, there's no, there's no uh, uh, process by which applicants are filtered. Uh, if you want to come to RPA, you sign up when it's time to sign up, and you get in if there's openings. If there's not openings, you go on a wait list in the order your application was received. So that's one thing I, I, I should clarify. There's, our student body is demographically similar to all the other student bodies. It's not, it's not unique in the sense that we only take this kind of kid or when we were. So anybody, it's a public school, it's open to all students. Um, in terms of what we do with our, our scholarship and preparing kids for college, we believe that it's our obligation to put students in the best position to be successful. And for many of those students, the ones that are going to college, that means putting them in a position where they can uh, earn scholarship dollars to help to help pay that bill. And so we focus on that as a part of what we do. We have a, a fully staffed college and career center. We've got an employee that, uh, Donna Nordstrom, you know some of her. Uh, her job, one of her key tenets of her job is to ensure that students 
apply for those scholarships because we believe that's important uh, for them to, to have that, that, to go through that process and hopefully maybe uh, earn a few dollars to help pay for, for their school. Yeah. Dan, and then I'll come over here. Yeah. Number of employees. Yeah, 65. Then, 65, that's all, all inclusive. Middle school as well. Middle school as well, yeah, 65 total employees in our organization. Because we're, we're a nonprofit company. I mean, uh, our DBA is Redmond Proficiency Academy. Our, our company is Personalized Learning Incorporated. I'm technically the executive director of Personalized Learning Incorporated, which is this company that has 65 employees that operate the Redmond Proficiency Academies. Then the other question is um, school activities, uh, sports in the Redmond School District, RPA students have the ability to uh, participate in those if they choose. Yeah. Is that is that true? So interesting thing, and it, uh, it reminds me uh, back to your comment in the back, the gentleman in the back that asked about the PERS and stuff, is that uh, um, when I went to Salem last session to t and I talked, sat down with uh, Representative Wisden, and I said, I said, Gene, we gotta find a way to get more money to schools. And he said to me, he goes, why do you need more money? You're doing better with less money. And I was like, oh, thanks, Gene. Well, uh, but I understood what he was saying, so that was, I was thinking about that when he said that. In that same conversation, we were talking about access for students to participate in interscholastic athletics and activities. Redmond School District has been a phenomenal partner for RPA. We have always had that ability. We've always shared that ability, shared that responsibility uh, for our students to participate in whatever their home school is. We don't offer athletics in our school. Students can participate those in their home school. Um, but last session, uh, the legislature passed a bill requiring school districts to allow charter school students to participate. Because up to that point, it was basically done on an individual negotiation basis. And we were fortunate enough to have a good partner that said, yeah, we want to do that. They're our kids. Yeah. Um, but now, uh, that's a requirement uh, that all districts provide that. But as with all things, now there's a cost. We have to pay 5% uh, of each student's independent ABM, or their, what we get from the state. We have to pay 5% for our students to participate. So what went from a free activity for, for our PA students to RPA is now a $25,000 bill that we have to pay to various districts so our students can participate. Okay. Yes, sir. Do they get a choice which school to go play athletics? They have to play at whatever their home school is. So if, they were, if they're in the Redmond High School boundary, yeah. they have to play at Redmond High School. Oh, if they're in the okay. Summit High School boundary, they have to play at Summit or whatever the, yeah. the case is. Great view. Yeah. One more question that we need. I didn't know if those were waves or questions. It freaked me out for a minute. There was lots of, there was lots of movement, so I got. Uh, I don't have to. Go ahead. Yeah. Do you have a program for life skills kids or special ed? No, we do not. So we have a special education program. In fact, our our, our percentage of our students with disabilities is is roughly the same as the rest of the school district. But one of the funding mechanisms is this: is that in the state of Oregon. Uh, and without getting into too much detail, the state of Oregon basically, students with disabilities can make up to, for funding purposes, up to 11% of your population. And for that 11% of your population, you get a double weight, which means you get two school funds for them, right? RPA does not get that other school fund. We only get the one weight. Um, the school district keeps the rest of that, and then they provide special education services to, the, to our building. Uh, and so uh, we have special education services. We, we have uh, a, a relatively proportionate number of students with disabilities, but life skills is a specific program that is housed in specific locations throughout the district. Yeah. Yeah. We'll stay around and have a few other questions after the meeting's over with, yeah. but it's uh, time for everybody to get back to work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.